Good afternoon. As is our custom here at the Reagan Library, if you could please stand and join me in a salute to the men and women who wear the uniform of our country around the world in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the first Center for Public Affairs event for 2013. My name is Joanne Drake and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It's gonna be another busy year here. We're just getting started with our events, book signings, and a lot of special speakers that we're gonna have. And in fact, our first event, the President's, what would have been his 102nd birthday, will be in less than two weeks. We hope the weather will clear up just a little bit and that you will all join us on that day. I wanna thank you all for coming and braving the weather this afternoon. I know we have um, with us a couple of special guests here. One, an elected official from an, our neighboring Agoura Hills. And of course, Duke Blackwood, the director of the library is here. We thank you all. And thank you again for braving the rain to come out. It was a little ugly out there on the freeway today. Our speaker today is a stranger to probably nobody in this room. And in fact, he was here back in December of 2011 at the end of our centennial year. Pete Hannaford met Ronald Reagan in the 1960s. And at the, uh, during the second term of Governor Reagan's years in Sacramento, Pete joined the staff there as an assistant to the governor and the director of public affairs. At the end of those years in Sacramento in the 1970s, Pete created his own public relations firm whose primary client was Ronald Reagan. Strange. It was during that time that Ronald Reagan hand wrote and delivered thousands of radio dresses to people across the nation. He ran in a tough presidential campaign against the incumbent, Jerry Ford, and then in 1980 became the Republican candidate for president. And the rest is history. But after that election and for the next eight years, Pete Hannaford stayed connected to Ronald Reagan as a private citizen through his firm and the campaign organization, offering political advice and wise counsel from outside the grounds of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He remained close to the president in his post-presidential years and up until the time that we lost him. He is president of Hannaford Enterprises, a public relations and public affairs firm that he founded himself in 1998 and he serves as a senior counselor for APCO Worldwide, which is also a large public affairs and strategic communications firm that's based in Washington. He's been around many presidents in his life and he's published 11 books thus far. I imagine there will be a few more. Six of those are about Ronald Reagan. This latest book, Presidential Retreats, has a full chapter on President Reagan's special retreat, Rancho del Cielo where, as Ronald Reagan said of the time he spent at this ranch, I do some of my best thinking there. And in fact, Pete told me that it was during the research that he was doing on that book that he was intrigued to do a little more research on where other presidents had their special retreats and found places to get away from the pressures of the office. Now, many of you probably know how Camp David got its name, right? But do you know the first president to use Camp David and what its original name was? Many of you have probably visited Ford's Theater and the house across the street where President Lincoln died and maybe even been to the Lincoln Presidential Library. But did you know that President Lincoln had a cottage within three miles of the White House called the Soldier's Home that he and his family would basically vacate the White House during the summer and slept there and he would travel to and from the White House every day because it was much cooler. I also learned um, of Pete's favorite story, or one of the, his favorite stories in the book today, about a presidential yacht and a very mysterious story surrounding it. So I hope he either tells the story or perhaps we can ask him the question at the end of this. He found a lot of really interesting facts and trivia stories about presidents as he did his research. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about this journey that took him across the country, literally, over the last I think about 10 years, as he discovered the truth about presidential retreats, where the presidents went and why they went there. 
I've heard it billed as a history lover's travel guide. Besides the great stories, what you will find in there are the websites and the phone numbers and the contact information for all of these retreat houses across the country, which makes it very easy for you to make contact as you plan your trips across this country. Pete will take questions at the end, so as he speaks, be sure and be thinking about what you can ask him, and then he's going to go upstairs and sign books in the museum store. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Pete Hannaford. Thank you, Joanne, for your kind introduction, ladies and gentlemen. I hope my talk lives up to the expectation that you may have from that introduction. Um, I came across a story the other day of um, talk at a service club in a distant city from here that had a somewhat different uh, outcome. Uh, it seems that uh, the notices went out to the members of the club that uh, the smartest investor since Warren Buffett is going to speak at our meeting next week. And so the uh, president of the club was to introduce this uh, man and he said, uh, our speaker today was the very first person to understand the tremendous amount of oil that could be recovered from the tar sands in Alberta, Canada. And he had the foresight to lease thousands upon thousands of acres of land to recover that oil, and he has made millions upon millions as a result. Well, the speaker got up and he said, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I would like to make a small correction, though, before I begin my remarks. It wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> and it wasn't the tar sands of Alberta, it was a gold mine in Nevada. <laughs> and it wasn't millions, it was thousands. And he didn't make it, he lost it. <laughs> so, as I say, I hope mine lives up to your expectations. Uh, 43 men have held 44 presidencies. One had two terms that were not consecutive, hence the difference in the numbers. We've had no women yet, but that'll happen too. Now, some of the presidents were tall and some of them were short. Some of them were thin, some of them were fat, uh, some were in between, and some were intense, some gregarious. Some wanted to accomplish things. Some had nothing they set out to accomplish. Some got on very well with Congress, some did not. But they all had one thing in common, and that is the need now and then to get away from the nearly constant pressures of the job. Now, for most of the early presidents, home was a large farm or plantation. It represented peace and quiet and a kind of a reassuring normalcy away from contentious congressional factions, office seekers with constant stream of office seekers, and unsolved policy problems. One early president, Thomas Jefferson, decided that he needed to go a step further than just have a nice home. And in his case, he needed to get away from the many friends and relatives who were constantly descending upon Monticello. And uh, he wanted to have his own retreat elsewhere. In fact, he created the first dedicated presidential retreat. It's called Poplar Forest, and it's about 60 miles away from Monticello. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now, there might have been more such hideaways or retreats, special retreats for the purpose, but the problems of early 19th century transportation were such that you couldn't just nip away for a weekend or even four or five days because it took too long to get there and too long to get back. So some went to popular spas that were near Washington, or they'd go on speaking tours just to get a change of scene um, and temporarily put aside the problems that they were facing back in the Capitol. Now, Lincoln was the next president, and you heard uh, Joanne mention this, to have a dedicated retreat. He lived there for three full summers and never had to leave the District of Columbia. And we'll come back to that too in, in a few moments. Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to move the White House staff and business, more or less lock, stock, and barrel, for the summer out of Washington to his home, Sagamore Hill, uh, on the north shore of uh, Long Island. William McKinley had a small farm not far from his home in Canton, Ohio, 
where he and his wife would spend long weekends and their summer vacations. More than a century after Jefferson built Poplar Forest, Herbert Hoover built the next dedicated retreat. Camp Rapidan, he called it, and it's in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It was rel a relatively short drive from Washington, about 60 miles, and could be enjoyed on many weekends and then for the longer stretch when Congress on was on recession in the summertime. Since then, having a special retreat um, or a borrowed or rent rented place uh, for a retreat has been the, really the pattern uh, for all the presidents since that time. Now, in this book, you'll find a chapter on every president from George Washington to Barack Obama. But each isn't just about where they went, because that in itself uh, wouldn't tell you an awful lot. Uh, it, it tells you what was going on at the time they were president. So you see the retreat that they went to in the context of their times and their personalities. Well, every president has a story to tell and I've written about the retreats and travels within this context. The first dedicated retreat, as I mentioned, was Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest. It was, it's west of Lynchburg, Virginia, by about 10 miles. Now, in his day, it was a tobacco plantation, about 5,000 acres, it was a big one, and it had been inherited by his wife, Martha, from her father. Now, you may have gotten the idea of a retreat away from Monticello when they visited it in 1781. I think it was their very first visit. Um, and it wasn't just a drive in the country that got, it, got them there. The Revolutionary War was still on, and the British wanted to capture him as a hostage. And he got word that they were coming to Monticello to get him. He had just finished a term as governor of Virginia, and the British didn't know this. They thought he was still the governor and that he'd be a great prize for them to have. So the Jeffersons got on horseback to ride to Poplar Forest. But on the way, Jefferson fell from his horse, and he ended up laid up for five weeks in the caretaker's cottage at Poplar Forest. Now there, his restless mind may have conceived the idea of one day building a house for himself and his wife to come to to get away from all the tumult at uh, Monticello. Alas, his wife Martha died the next year, so any ideas he may have had for a retreat had to be laid aside. In the 1790s, he served mostly overseas, and then, of course, as Washington's Secretary of State. Finally, after he'd done that for several years, he decided it was time to retire, and this time he would retire to uh, Monticello. Uh, it was a temporary retirement, as we know, because in 1800, his uh, supporters and friends were urging him to run for president. But before he was actually running for it, he went back to Poplar Forest. He was caught in a three-day thunderstorm this time, and again, he had to stay in the caretaker's cottage. Um, but he seriously began planning a retreat. Now, the demands of his new office once he was elected consumed all of his time, and he couldn't move forward. He did it fitfully from then on. It was not until 1806, halfway through his second term, that the foundation for Poplar Forest was laid. He was there for that uh, process, and he did visit it during construction. However, he did not actually sleep in the new house until shortly after his term had expired. Um, and um, it was about three months after. Uh, however, after that, he um, visited many, many times um, Poplar Forest, and he often spent several weeks at a time because he was no longer in office, and mostly what he wanted to do there was think and write and contemplate and visit with occasional friends who came by. Another president, Andrew Jackson, had a beautiful retreat, the Hermitage, which is outside of Nashville, Tennessee, it was a productive plantation, but it was 600 miles from Washington, too far away but any but summer visits when Congress is in recess. And that was true for several other early presidents, as I mentioned. Now, one early one, however, the ninth president, William Henry Harrison, had a place relatively near Washington. You'll recall he's the president who died 30 days after he was inaugurated. Now, at the inauguration ceremony, he did not wear an overcoat, and it was a chilly March 4th. He gave what is still the longest inaugural address on record, well over an hour. Of course, he 
caught, he took ill from that, uh, developed into pneumonia, and uh, he never really overcame it, and he died 30 days later. What I learned in researching this, however, was I knew that Harrison had been governor of the huge Indiana Territory, which comprises what are now about five states. And I guess I thought he had come from there originally. He'd won the Battle of Tippecanoe in what's now Ohio, uh, and a log cabin was the theme of his presidential campaign. This happened because there was a kind of a uh, quite critical cartoon drawn in some newspaper of him as a candidate saying he might as well sit in, being a big soldier, he might as well sit in front of his log cabin and sip whiskey. Well, his campaign people very wisely understood the symbolism of log cabins. In those days, uh, uh, presidents and people who aspired to it frequently had been born in log cabins. So that became the theme of his campaign, and they had it on banners and posters everywhere. So, of course, you might have thought from that that he was born in a log cabin, but it wasn't so. He was born at Berkeley Plantation, a very large and thriving plantation on the James River outside of Richmond. And about two weeks before his inauguration, he came to Washington briefly and then went straight on to Berkeley Plantation uh, where he uh, wrote his inaugural address. Now, Berkeley Plantation was just not some incidental place he happened to stop at. It had been in the family for many generations. One of his ancestors had signed the Declaration of Independence and lived there. Two of them had been governors of Virginia, and he indeed was born there and grew up there. So uh, he uh, had a silver spoon, not a log cabin as his symbol, really. Well, he wrote that inaugural address, and from that, we can infer that had he lived, Berkeley Plantation would have been his logical retreat whenever he could get away. Well, 20 years after that, uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't have to leave the District of Columbia for his retreat, as I mentioned. He found it in the form of a guest cottage on the grounds of the Soldier's Home, which is way in the northeastern corner of the district. It's about uh, three miles from the White House. Now, in those days, of course, it was all countryside up there. Today, it's completely built up. But the Soldier's Home grounds look about the way they did. There have been a couple of newer buildings since then but the cottage and certain other guest cottages are still there. Now, it was several hundred feet in elevation uh, above the downtown area, so it was considerably cooler in the summer, and most of all, there were steady breezes in the summer, which simply pushed the mosquitoes away. Well, the demands of the war made it impossible for Reagan to get away, uh, for uh, Lincoln, excuse me, to get away for vacations. So he and his wife moved there for the entire summer in three years, 1862, 63, and 64. Early each morning, he would ride his horse to the White House and back at the end of the day, accompanied by a small cavalry escort for security. The cottage is simple in design, and it looks to be modest in size from the outside, but once you get inside, you learn that it actually has 30 rooms. Now, in it, he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, and he had many meetings with cabinet officers and other senior officials and leaders. But he still found time for readings in the evening and recitations of classics uh, with family and friends. So it was very relaxing for him, too. On April 13, 1865, he and his cavalry escort rode out to the cottage from the White House to look it over. Of course, he hadn't been there for months. Uh, this was probably an anticipation of happy times ahead in the coming summer. Alas, the next night, April 14th, at Ford's Theater, Abraham Lincoln was mortally wounded. Easily the most unusual retreat which I discovered was one taken by Grover Cleveland in June 19, 1893, excuse me, 1893, the first year of his second term. Now, in that spring, his doctor diagnosed a what he called a non-malignant tumor in the back of Cleveland's mouth and said an operation is a necessity. Well, Cleveland took his advice. And he remembered that he had a friend with a large yacht that he kept at a harbor on the north shore of Long Island. The press was notified that the president would take a yachting vacation in July. That was all. On July 1st, he left Washington by train for New York, 
then boarded the yacht accompanied by his physician and a nurse. The operation was performed as the yacht cruised Long Island Sound. Now the procedure took out part of his upper jaw, so on July 17th, a second operation took place in which an orthodontist fitted Cleveland with a prosthetic device, and this restored his appearance to normal. He recovered quickly and returned in late August to the White House. Very fit, looking well, perfectly happy and rested. And so the White House put out a press notice that during his relaxing vacation, the president had two bad teeth removed. Now no one, not the vice president, not the cabinet, not the Congress, not the press, or the public, knew anything about the operation. It was not until several decades later when a journalist who'd gotten word about it the story at the time kept it all to himself, but finally let it out. This is in the 1920s. Now, there's a saying in the nation's capital that there are no secrets in Washington, but this is the exception that proves that rule. I mentioned that Theodore Roosevelt would be the first, but certainly not the last uh, president to um, um, move the daily business of the presidency to his retreat. This was his home and estate on uh, the north shore of Long Island, overlooking Oyster Bay. Uh, in his boyhood, Sagamore Hill had been his family's summer retreat. He lived in Manhattan uh, as an adult until he became an office holder um, or vice president. He loved the outdoor activities there as a boy and so longed to recreate all of these things. So as president, as soon as the humidity made Washington unbearable, he moved to Sagamore Hill. The staff had an office uh, in the village nearby, but also took over the library in the president's home during those weeks. And among other visitors, he entertained both the Russian and de Japanese delegations at Sagamore Hill in 1905. This was during the time that he was negotiating the peace treaty between the two of them, an effort that won him the Nobel Peace, peace Prize. Well, Sagamore Hill was a working farm. It had a dairy herd, a pig pen, stables, um, horse pastures, grain fields, even a large apple orchard. Roosevelt often joined the farm workers pitching hay, chopping trees, and doing other farm chores. He liked physical exercise. Well, 122 years after Jefferson laid the foundation for Poplar Forest, President-elect Herbert Hoover selected the site for the second purpose-built retreat. This is the one he called Camp Rapidan in the Shenandoah Valley and it got its name from a river that was formed where two creeks meet. Now, Hoover paid for the property personally, and he paid for all the building materials, but a marine engineer team actually constructed the rustic cabins there. It was quite comfortable, even though very simple. Now, the Hoover spent many weekends there during his presidency, and uh, um, during the summer when Congress is on recess, they would go out for about a month uh, for a longer vacation. And during those times, he welcomed quite a number of important foreign guests. Well, some members of Hoover's cabinet liked the place so well that they bought some acreage less than a mile down the stream and built their own camp there so they could come as neighbors. After Franklin Roosevelt defeated Hoover in 1932, uh, Hoover suggested Camp Rapidan as a retreat for Roosevelt. Now, FDR did go to visit, but he found it would not be suitable. Uh, from the roadhead to the camp itself, there's about half to three quarters of a mile of a trail. It's an easy enough trail to walk, but for a wheelchair, almost impossible. And as Roosevelt could only walk a few steps at a time, and then with the help of two canes, it, it simply was not practical. So he thanked Hoover and declined. Well, at that point, Hoover donated the camp to the federal government. And for several years, it was used by senior government officials on a sign-up basis to be used as a weekend retreat. For FDR, Warm Springs, Georgia became his favorite retreat. He also took occasional ocean fishing trips, which he liked to do and occasional visits to his family's uh, Hyde Park estate on the Hudson River. He was introduced to Warm Springs in 1924, 
It was a rundown resort, but had one great feature, artesian springs that fed a large natural pool with warm water, constantly warm water. He found he could swim for hours with full mobility in his crippled leg, so he loved the place. He invested in it, and he brought in a friend to restore it. And once restored, he then invited many people with crippling ailments uh, to enjoy the waters. He had a cottage built on the grounds for himself. In fact, he died in that cottage in 1945. But when the war began, he had to stick close to Washington. Frequent trips to Warm Springs, which were always by train, were out. So he asked the National Park Service to find him some federally owned land for a camp. They found three sites for him to see within a, about a half day's drive from the White House. The first one had been built by, a, by the WPA as a boys camp. By 1942, it was unused. It was 60 miles from northwest of the capital in the Catoctin Mountains of, of Maryland near the Pennsylvania state line. The camp enjoyed cool breezes away from Washington's humidity. It was very rustic, more rustic than Hoover's camp. But FDR saw its possibilities. He named it Shangri-La after a mythical place in the book Lost Horizon, a very popular novel of the 30s and later made into a popular movie. Presumably in the Himalayas, Shangri-La was a place where the sun always shone, there were never any disputes, and everyone was happy. So you can see that once Roosevelt saw this place, he thought of it in those terms. They could have a very relaxing weekend there, no disputes, just interesting conversations. Well, the camp became FDR's wartime regular retreat. Officials often joined him for planning sessions, and every president after FDR has used the camp. It was President Eisenhower who renamed it Camp David after both his father and his grandson, and David was also his own middle name. And of course, it's been Camp David ever since. Nobody's ever sought to change it to anything else. After World War II, when air travel became faster and more readily accessible, presidents began to travel more and more in addition to international meetings and so forth. Uh, they also uh, went to much more distant sites for retreats in the United States. Harry Truman, for example, discovered the Naval Air Station at Key West, Florida. It was surrounded by a high chain link fence, several acres. The Secret Service liked this retreat very much, for Truman could take his long early morning constitutional walks, maybe a couple of miles, to his heart's content without ever leaving the grounds, and he was perfectly safe. Eisenhower used Camp David extensively, and later, of course, he purchased a farm in near Gettysburg, which is not very far from Camp David. John Kennedy had his own family's um, compound at the base of Cape Cod, uh, in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, as well as a leased place in the horse country in Middleburg, Virginia. Now, Lyndon Johnson was the first of three presidents to have a ranch as his retreat. It's not far from Fredericksburg in the Texas Hill Country. It is now a 2,800-acre ranch, when, um, but was not that big when he purchased it from a relative when he was a U.S. senator. He visited it often from then on through his vice presidency and presidency and into retirement. One photo I've seen shows him uh, with chairs, folding chairs on the lawn under a big oak tree, uh, in deep in conversation with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his national security team, probably discussing the Vietnam War. Richard Nixon bought homes in Key Biscayne, Florida, and San Clemente on the Southern California coast and spent time at both places. Gerald Ford had long taken summer and ski vacations near Vail, Colorado, and owned a condominium there. He later added a home in Rancho Mirage near Palm Springs. This was on a golf course, so he didn't have to walk very far to tee the ball. Jimmy Carter's um, retreat was his home in Plains, Georgia. Now, one well-known Washington reporter once told me that when he was assigned one year to what he called Plains duty, it was, quote, the longest two weeks I have ever spent. Ronald Reagan acquired his uh, 688 ranch, acre ranch, which he called Rancho del Cielo, 
a few weeks before the end of his second term as governor. During the next year, he spent any spare time he had, along with two others, remodeling the modest adobe cottage and building fences and getting the barn ready for horses. Once he was president, he and his wife visited whenever business brought him to the West Coast, plus every Thanksgiving holiday and summer vacation. And there he received his daily national security briefing and set aside time to attend to official papers. Usually that was most of the morning. Then he would spend the rest of the day after lunch on horseback and clearing brush and cutting wood. He once said, I, as Joanne mentioned, I do some of my best thinking when I'm working outdoors, and he meant it. The Reagans also entertained several major foreign visitors at the ranch. The day Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip came, it was to be a return horseback ride for the one he took at uh, Windsor Great Park with the Queen the, the year before, 1982. Only we had one of the wettest winters we'd had on record up to that time, and they got there in driving rain, and uh, the Secret Service, there's no chance for a horseback ride. In, indeed, we all ought to get in SUVs right now and get ourselves off this mountaintop. So they did. That was the end of the visit. The first George Bush loved his family's compound, which it had owned for a long time, at Walker Point near Kennebunkport on the southern Maine coast. Now, the Clintons had no home to go to back in Arkansas, and they did not own a retreat property. So they visited friends, often on Martha's Vineyard, and stayed with the friends. In 1996, when he was up for re-election, Bill Clinton asked his pollster, Dick Morris, to find out where people thought he should go on vacation that year. Well. Morris reported that public opinion was against Martha's Vineyard. It was too, quote, elitist, unquote. People wanted him to go to a more, quote, natural, unquote, quote, quote, place. So the Clintons went to, of all places, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the horseman's, elitist horseman's mecca. Now there he made sure that the national press photographed him on a horse in a western saddle uh, wearing blue jeans, a cowboy shirt, and a 10-gallon hat. Once safely re-elected, the Clintons returned to Martha's Vineyard the next year. <laughs> George W. Bush was the third president to favor a ranch. In 1999, when he was governor of Texas, he purchased Prairie Chapel Ranch, a 1,583-acre spread. They kept the old house as a guest house and built a new one. It uses solar heat, has a geothermal pump that keeps the place warm in winter and cool in the summer. It uses no fossil fuels. Rainwater is collected in a large underground cistern, and gray water from the household use is purified and stored in other, other tanks to water shrubs and flowers in the garden, most of which are native plants. Now, one wonders if Al Gore's house has these features. <laughs> now, with President Obama's second term, uh, having just begun, it's likely he will continue the, his vacation pattern of the last four years, a leased estate on Martha's Vineyard in the summer and one in Hawaii for Christmas vacation. But wherever they have gone or will go, all presidents need a place where they can slow down from the tempo of the office. No matter where their place of retreat, Ronald Reagan may have captured the essence of modern presidential retreats when he said of his own, if this isn't actually heaven, it's in the same zip code. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Gee, you've all read the book, so you don't have any questions. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Yes, um, sir. How, are any thoughts concerning a, a president's family, ch smaller children, how that affected their retreats? Uh, anything come to mind re regarding the, the family situations that presidents found themselves in? Well, of course, some of them had pretty good-sized families. Some of them had growing children. Some had grown children. Um, I think of Roosevelt, for example, who had a, a combination of different ages with all of his children, five or six children. Um, that he liked a place where they could get out and ride horses in the afternoon, play ball of one kind or another. Um, 
a rough house, that sort of thing. And that was certainly a consideration for him because he remembered all of these things that he would loved doing as a boy. So that was one example. Um, I can think of one very tragic example. Franklin Pierce, who was never considered to have been much of a success as a president, uh, 1848 to 52, um, during the transition, they were heading home from a visiting friends in um, Massachusetts along the North Shore on a train when uh, the train hit some kind of a snag and the car ahead of them in which their son was riding, uh, 11 year old son, uh, plunged off the embankment that the rails were on and the boy was crushed. Uh, and this cast a terrible pall over the entire Pierce presidency. He grieved for all four years. It was so, so bad. So he never really went on a retreat in those four years. His wife died shortly as, as after his term ended, and he then bought or leased a small cottage on the New Hampshire shore, which, as you know, isn't very long, uh, which he had for a few years before his death. But uh, that was a kind of a star-crossed uh, reasoning involved there. Yes, ma'am. The pool that uh, Roosevelt swam in, uh, are those maintained or does it exist anymore? At Warm Springs, right? Please repeat. The pools, the swimming pool. Oh, yeah, at you, you had mentioned Roosevelt. Is it there? Yes, is it still maintained? It's still there. It's now owned by, I think owned by the state of Georgia. Okay, so you can go and still. And it's available to the public. Oh. I, I believe that's the case, yes. Anyone else? Yes. Lady right here. Didn't you have your hand up? No. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Well, I'm glad you know everything you need to know about presidential retreats. Well, thank you again for having me.